time. Uh, housekeeping, Taylor, you told me to say some things. Uh, just pop in. Taylor's on there as a uh, moderator, and there's a term for it. But essentially, if you have any questions, this is a webinar, so all the participants are muted. So if you have any questions, just uh, type them in. I think there's a Q&A spot to your Zoom meeting or your Zoom webinar. So any questions, type them into the Q&A, and one of the moderators, Matt's on the call here, Taylor's on the call. Because we're tight for time, we only have 30 minutes, so Matt and Taylor will answer the questions as we go. And then after the 30 minutes, anyone who uh, wants to stay and chat, we can open it up for an open discussion. But we'll try to stay on time. Like I said, this is our second go at it, so uh, we apologize for any hiccups or technical issues we may have. Um, yeah, so let's get started. First of all, thank you everyone for taking time today. Uh, we know all of our situations professionally and personally have changed uh, quite a bit in the last few weeks. So all we're trying to do is make sure, you know, as we come into, in some cases, a little more dad downtime, that we all can be building and growing together. And, and we're just trying to bring some value in a different uh, avenue, in a different avenue right now, given everything that's going on. So thanks for taking time. We hope to bring some value. These presentations, this webinar series that we're going to do, We'll see how it goes uh, and see if we continue it, but essentially we just want to share information that we've been acquiring over the last you know, year or two as an agency and, and some research that we've done and some changes we think will be relevant for the electrical industry. So these presentations aren't going to be product or manufacturer specific. We're trying to cover a broad stroke uh, and just give people thoughts and ideas of how we can improve our own businesses and where we think this industry may go and, and help identify some opportunities in that growth sector. So let's see if I can switch slides. There we go. So just a quick outline, like I said, it's 30 minutes. So for people who don't know us or our business, I'll just dive real quickly into our story. We want to talk about the driving factors and that'll really give you a, a better appreciation of where we think some of these opportunities lie if we look at what's driving the change in the electrical industry. Specifically, we'll look at solar. Uh, our Atlantic Canadian market has done very well in the solar market in the last um, two years. We'll talk about that. The electrification, what that means and what that means to us. And then what we think is coming next, battery storage, demand side load management, and you know, electric vehicle is not a new thought or term, but it, uh, it's definitely going to change significantly. Um, in the electrical industry here in the short term. So we'll talk about that as well. So our story for anyone who doesn't know us, so we are a manufacturer's rep agency. And what we do as a business is we connect global manufacturers to our local markets. So uh, a manufacturer typically has two ways to do product development and sales in a territory. One is to hire that direct sales force or the other is to contract the sales agency. So that's what we do. Some projects for people who are, uh, you know, who know the Halifax market and are from Atlanta, Canada. Some projects we've been lucky enough to work on uh, is the Nova Center, a pretty iconic building that was done here. And we were able to provide all the custom endpoint power systems on that. So all the convention center floor boxes, which included electrical and water service for that convention center space. Queensmark project, which will probably be delayed now, uh, given everything that's going on. But Queensmark is going to be a very iconic building as well down on the Halifax waterfront. And we were lucky enough to provide all the residential lighting and all the uh, electrical devices on this project. And another one that is really relatable to what we're doing today, most people would recognize this building if you're coming through Truro on your way to Halifax or vice versa. It's the Rath Eastland Community Center. And there was a community feed and tariff project under community solar, which we'll talk about. And they, they were awarded a 90 kilowatt um, renewable energy system, solar array specifically. So we were lucky enough to provide that for this project. So now on the renewables, what we're doing here is really we're preparing for a greenhouse gas free future. For anyone who followed the latest federal election, this was a, uh, a hot topic by all parties involved. But we do as a, as a country have some commitments to it. So the driver is really, and what's I mean, what's moving our industry and moving the needle in this side of the industry is the environmental aspect. Uh, and environmental is nice, you know, you'll get some early adopters and you'll get people who are doing it for the right reasons, but you don't get that mass adoption, and that mass migration to a product until the financial starts to make sense. So we'll touch on that return on investment 
And the last thing with those two shifts, of course, you're going to have electrification. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail and all the opportunities that lie in that electrification. So as I mentioned a second ago, the federal election this year had a very specific focus on, um, on the environment. And in the commitment, the Liberals have uh, committed to making a 30% reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And that's 30% 30, or 30 below our 2005 levels. So we've now made a commitment and now they're stimulating and incentivizing certain market center, uh, sections to hit that commitment. So here in Atlantic Canada, we've had access through the federal, what's known as the Federal Low Carbon Economy Leadership Fund. We have access now to some of that federal stimulus money. New Brunswick was allocated 42 million, Nova Scotia 56 million and PEI 24 million. Now, each province is allowed to uh, distribute that money as they see fit, as long as it equates to the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in those individual provinces. And for people who think, you know, we're relatively clean out here on the East Coast, these numbers and this metrics, the graphs you're seeing there, are based on CO2 equivalents per capita. So that's the metric that matters, not how much total CO2 you admit, but how, many, how much CO2 per person you're admitting. So, on a per capita basis, Atlantic Canada is one of the dirtier provinces by that standard. So of that low carbon economy leadership fund, I mentioned how much each province got in that pool. And then specifically what's helping driving some of these sectors we're going to talk about is there was $16 million allocated under the solar homes program in Nova Scotia and $2 million now in PEI under their residential commercial solar program. And you'll also see there on that pie chart, just a slice of what our actual generation is per source. And I just want to throw this slide in here because it's topical with everything that's going on, you know, travel being cut off, industries being cut off. Uh, this is a shot of a two week spread essentially, or a 20 day spread in China before, you know, full lockdown versus um, currently, which, you know, things are coming back online there. But if we look in February from the 10th to the 25th, and this is nitrogen dioxide levels. So this is what you know air quality can look like once this change is made. And this really ties into that environmental rationale and factor of why we're all trying to do this. We'll do it for the right reasons. So that's the environmental aspect. That's where some of the funding's coming from. And I'm sure we're gonna see even more funding pumped into these sectors uh, you know, once we start coming out of this potential recession we're leading into. But the next one is, you know, environmental drives it. Federal stimulus is always a good way to start something, but eventually it's gotta make sense. So with solar specifically, how do we get paid on it? Uh, the most common program here in Atlantic Canada is what's known as net metering. So essentially on my own home, I have a seven kilowatt system on my roof. If the loads in my home, so you know, my washer, my dryer, my electric heating system, lighting loads, if the loads in my home are consuming less power than the solar array on my roof is producing, all that excess power backflows through my bi-directional or what's known as a net meter. That is tracked as a net credit on my bill. So if I'm buying power from the utility here at 15 cents a kilowatt hour, Inversely, I'm also selling any excess power I'm producing at 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So that excess power stays on your power bill as a net credit. It's normally done over a 12 month cycle. Uh, so at the end of that 12 months, any exist or sorry, any excess credit, depending on the market, Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia Power will pay you out on that excess production. In a lot of markets, they won't. It's a wash and you start that 12 month cycle again. So what we see here typically is during the productive summer months, you'll see excess production because we're not running those heating loads. Typically, we don't run a lot of air conditioning out here. So you'll, during those long summer days, lower demand on your home, you know, you'll produce all those excess credits. And then in the shorter winter months where we're drawing more power, we'll consume those credits. Now, Nova Scotia Power, even though they will pay you out on excess production, they will not um, allow you to over-design the system. So they actually look at the consumption and when systems are designed by installers in this market, they have to be designed to equate to roughly what that home would consume in a year. 
Another common program, and this became well known in Canada because of the Ontario marketplace, this is the feed-in tariff program or a FIT program. A feed-in tariff works slightly different uh, in the sense that a net metered program, you're getting paid one to one. So for every kilowatt hour I produce, I'm, I'm getting paid the same as what I'm consuming it for. A feed-in tariff program is different because where a net metering program typically ties to a direct subsidy or a direct rebate, which we'll talk about in a second, a feed-in tariff program tariffs the product or sorry, the produced power. So you end up with two meters, an import and an export meter, or a net and a gross meter. And you agree on a, on a purchase power agreement, say for 20 years with the utility, that your tariff rate is going to be X cents per kilowatt hour. So in Ontario, I think it started in the 80 cents per kilowatt hour range. Here in uh, Nova Scotia, we have a COMFIT, a community feed-in tariff for non-for-profit buildings. And I've seen rates on that PPA go anywhere from 25 cents all the way up to the high 30 cents a kilowatt hour. So your subsidy is in the form of that tariff rate. So I'm buying, say, commercially at 14 cents, but I'm able to sell in the 30 plus cents per kilowatt hour range. And that's how the payback is realized a little faster on a feed-in tariff program. The other one that exists here in our provinces and some other provinces uh, are what they call behind the meter. Now, this project was not supposed to go this way, but for anyone who knows the IKEA building in Dartmouth, and know some of the uh, story behind this. When IKEA originally did the design and they were working with Nova Scotia Power on this building, specifically the solar array on the roof, it was done, uh, oh wait, Keith has a question maybe? Taylor and Matt, I don't know if you see that. I'm gonna keep flowing and Keith will, um, I don't know how to unmute you. Keith, my apologies, I see you're raising your hand. We're not that technical yet. I don't know what to do with it but the team's there to help you. So uh, anyway, get back to the behind the meters. So when this building was originally designed, Nova Scotia Power didn't have any limitations on their net metering. So it was a, just under a megawatt. But once the building was being built, Nova Scotia Power and some other utilities in the region put a cap on the maximum amount you could backfeed. And that maximum amount was 100 kilowatts. So no agreement was ever reached with Nova Scotia Power and IKEA. So this entire system exists what we call behind the meter. So every kilowatt hour produced from the solar array is self-consumed by the building. Anytime it's producing more than it's consuming, that power just gets dumped, unfortunately. So for anyone in the land of Canada, these are the utilities that we have out here right now that offer net metering programs. All of these programs are capped at 100 kilowatts. That's the maximum you can backfeed. AC, you can actually have a larger DC size, which is related to to oversizing, but essentially Summerside, Maritime, and PEI, Newfoundland Hydro, uh, and Newfoundland Power in Newfoundland, and then Nova Scotia Power here in New Brunswick, and NB Power. So all net metered offerings all capped at 100 kilowatts. So on the, keeping on the financial side, the other thing that has really driven this, definitely in the Nova Scotia market for anyone who's familiar with the program here, and now the uptake we're starting to see in Prince Edward Island, and what we predict we'll see in uh, the other Atlantic provinces, as well as other provinces across the country who haven't had a program yet, but rebates. That's the biggest thing, and this specifically ties into net metering. So we started with solar homes, or sorry, we still have solar homes. That was that $16 million we had allocated here in Nova Scotia to subsidize residential solar. When the program started, it was the um, criteria were a dollar, one dollar per watt. So if I was a homeowner, and I put 10,000 watts of solar on my home, which is what the program was capped at. You could go above 10,000, you just wouldn't get the rebate. Um, you know, if you put a 10,000 watt system on at $1 per watt, that was a $10,000 instant rebate or a check back to you or the installer for putting that system on your house. Because it was 16 million and it was a fixed amount and it was guaranteed over four years, the uptake was so high. We have well over a thousand homes now in two years that have been done in Nova Scotia under this program the rebate actually got reduced. So now it went from a dollar a watt to 85 cents a watt, and we're all the way down to um, 60 cents a watt. But the uptake is still high, you know, it's still a great rebate, it's still a great incentive just compared to where it started. And then Efficiency PEI, they are uh, at a dollar a watt right now. And their program is a little more interesting because there's also rebate dollars available for commercial. So residential is at a dollar a watt, and commercial I think is at 30 cents per watt. 
The last thing I'd like to talk about is the accelerated investment incentive for anybody who's looking at doing commercial outside that community feed-in tariff, which kind of applies to non-for-profit commercial in Nova, Nova Scotia. The accelerated investment incentive is a federal tax break. So typically uh, on a commercial capital expenditure, you would depreciate that, uh, you know, if it's a depreciating asset, you would depreciate it over the life of the asset. Under the accelerated investment incentive, it allows commercial buildings to write off 100% of the fixed cost of that asset in the first year. So it's a significant tax break and definitely anyone who's working with commercial buildings should be aware of it and make sure that's being captured on the ROI and that payback. Matt or Taylor, are you seeing these pop-ups for questions? Sorry, we'll keep going. So loans. Um, also, you know, the rebates are great. We need a way to generate revenue for the renewables that we're putting on our spaces. Ultimately, you also, in most cases, need a way to finance that. So you need a loan to put against it. There's a few programs, specifically one of the most lucrative if you were just looking at all things being even is a PACE loan. This is known as a property assessed clean energy loan. Here in Nova Scotia, it's administered uh, you know, by four or five different municipalities, including Halifax. This loan goes specifically against your property bill, against your property tax. So it doesn't tie to you, the homeowner. It doesn't affect your debt service ratio. It doesn't matter what your credit score is. As long as you have a property bill in good standing, you can access a case loan for solar. CDFs, these are Community Economic Development Infrastructure Funds. These were built out, I only knew of them in Nova Scotia. Specifically, it was a way for individuals to help other individuals with some high risk business ventures, right? If you had a family member who wanted to start a coffee shop, it was a way for you to get a tax break to help them with the financing of that business. But now they're being applied to renewable energy. And I have heard um, some talk of New Brunswick coming out with a CDF program that could tie into renewables. The other more common ones you'll see too are banks. Credit Union Atlantic has a phenomenal program here for renewable energy or any home energy saving projects in general. RBC is the same way. And the last one for commercial, of course, you can go and get financing for corporate and uh, infrastructure debt financing, like any investment you would make uh, in a corporate building or commercial building, sorry. So just to finish up on financials, I just want to give a perspective of what people are paying for these systems. Residential is by far the biggest market right now in Atlantic Canada, so we'll focus on that. Um, the average system cost right now is $2.90 per watt. That's taxing. That's kind of where the market has leveled out here in Nova Scotia with two years of high growth. Um, 8,900 watts, I mentioned that the rebate max is out at 10,000 watts. The average system size, which is typically due to roof limitations, is uh, 8,900 watts. So gross cost on that is just under 26,000. If I was in PEI right now putting that system up, uh, I would get an $8,900 rebate. So that is a just under a $17,000 system for the homeowner tax in. And what that means for us in the electrical industry, if you have a contractor or for contractors on this call, if you're doing roughly um, you know, 50 homes a year, that's a million dollars you've added in gross revenue to your business. And for the distributor, you, know, you partner with two or three of those contractors with material costs being around 25 to 40%, depending on a lot of variables, you know, three or four contractors, and you've also added a million dollars in electrical sales to your bottom line and you're accessing that additional revenue through a product that already exists, which is the residential home. You're already in that space anyway. So that's the real value in going after this market with the customer bases we already have. So here's what makes sense to most homeowners. If I'm selling a system, this is the by far the math metric that closes more deals than any. And in what is my ROI? as a percentage, as a percentage comparable to any other investment. So let's say pre, uh, pre two weeks ago, if I was investing in the S&P 500, the most lucrative stock market in the world over the last 50 years, my average return after inflation is just under 7%. This is the average return we're seeing in Atlanta, Canada right now on a residential solar when rebates exist in those markets and it's 10.5%. Now, for anyone who's following the markets right now, which I'm trying not to, where you've seen a contraction, I think, of over 30%. So the beautiful thing about this as an investment 
on your own home is that 10 and a half percent is locked in with you with the utility so if the sun is shining you're guaranteed that revenue it doesn't have the volatility of a traditional stock investment and even if you went out and got this financed with the financing rates being so low right now um, you know your finance rate could be four four and a half or less on a product like this so you're still on finance dollars returning over six percent on that investment using someone else's capital a couple more slides just to finish up on solar um, you know a lot of people think of Canada is not a very attractive energy market for a few reasons one is what they call solar irradiance or potential to produce energy from the Sun and two you know in a lot of markets uh, we have low utility rates relative to other parts of the world but this is what matters. This is how you actually gauge the potential production for solar in Canada. So you'll see here this slide bar. You know, we've been talking or I've been talking about watts. You know, when we're sizing solar systems, we talk about watts. Uh, but we don't buy and sell watts. We buy and sell kilowatt hours. So this bar represents for every thousand watts or one kilowatt that I put on my property in these different areas in Canada, how many kilowatt hours on average per year will that one uh, kilowatt or thousand watts produce? And you can see in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick's a little better, uh, Newfoundland's getting a little less productive, but essentially we're between 1100 and 1300 kilowatt hours per thousand watts of DC that I put on my property per year. So if I go up to that $10,000 max rebate amount, now I'm producing, you know, 11,000 to 13,000 kilowatt hours per year. And for all the naysayers who say we still don't have a good energy market, this is a shot of the most productive, uh, or sorry, not the most productive, the most highly adopted. So per capita, this is Germany. Germany has more solar deployed per capita than any other country in the world. And they have less access to solar or solar irradiance than we do. Okay, this is a typical single line. I didn't want to make this too technical. I really just wanted to talk about the drivers, but for anyone who's interested, uh, this is what a typical residential solar array would look like. It varies slightly depending if you're under that feed and tariff program or you're under a net metered program, but essentially solar panels on your roof, some form of what they call MPPT, max power point tracking per panel. So that's either done with the power optimizers or the um, microinverters. So those are up sitting behind every panel. We series those panels together parallel in the case of a microinverter. Then we either have DC or AC coming off the roof to some sort of combiner or inverter. From there, if it's a net metered system, you actually back feed that whole array out from the output of the inverter into your electrical panel. And then from that electrical panel, the home would consume the power produced, any excess would backflow onto the grid and that would be tracked by your net meter. Uh, the other option would be kind of what you see here, the net versus gross meter for a feed-in tariff. So in that scenario, all produced power is fed directly through the um, gross meter just to track gross production off that solar array. So you're getting paid at the tariff rate you agree to. So the electrification of everything, this is important. It's a term that ElectroFed uses quite often, but essentially if we're gonna move to a GHG-free future, uh, everything we know now that is combustion, has to switch to electric. So that includes our vehicles, our space heating, our water heating, anything you can think of. So that's the third driver, right? As demand, um, demand will go up, products become more efficient, but as we shift towards this electrification, demand on that grid will go up. So battery storage, we've had success in the last two years with renewables in our, in our Atlantic market. The next big shift, you know, we truly believe is going to be battery storage. It's not a new technology, but what it's going to be utilized for is different maybe than some people have realized. You know, the drivers typically for battery storage have been backup power or UPSs for commercial or hospitals, right? When you need that transfer to happen to the gen set, but you don't want interrupted power. So that's typical. And most homeowners today, which is going to be one of the bigger markets for battery storage in the next um, you know, one to five years. Most homeowners still think, and a lot of solar contractors we work with, assume that if you have solar on your roof, you can throw a battery on there and you've got a great backup source. So that's one driver. The, the other driver that really shaped the California market is what they call peak shaving, which we'll talk about. And then the third one, which we genuinely believe is gonna change our marketplace here in Atlanta, Canada, is demand side load management. 
So backup power, it is an option. Most um, solar inverter manufacturers offer some sort of DC or AC coupling for battery storage. Uh, the downside with battery storage here in the Canadian marketplace is typically if power does go out, it's during a storm cycle, and those storm cycles are typically in the winter months when there's very low solar irradiance. So it's very difficult uh, to recharge a battery system off solar during kind of the late spring, winter, or sorry, early spring, uh, winter, and late fall months. So it's very difficult to recharge that battery system. And ultimately, we just have a lot of demand, especially if you're electric electrically heated to produce the amount of energy a home is required in the winter months on electric electric heat from a battery system is extremely expensive. Unfortunately, that's why uh, most homeowners who want to become more green will still require generator sets if they want backup power. Now, a lot of the inverters on the market will work in a hybrid combination where you can have battery, solar, and backfeed a generator at the same time. It's just very costly right now for the homeowners to do that. The next thing uh, is peak shaving, and we've seen this in Vermont, we've seen it in California, some other large markets in the U.S., you know, where energy is traded like the commodity that it is, um, demand, supply and demand economics come into play. So in the California market, what battery storage, with smart battery storage allows homeowners to do is avoid those costly peak demand charges or commercial buildings or even utilities. So that stored energy can be purchased uh, during off-peak times at, at lower rates, and then it can be used to peak shave during uh, peak demand times. So the facility or the home could draw power from those battery banks when it's the most expensive to buy from the grid. And that's why Tesla has done so well uh, with their battery systems in the California market, not even coupled with solar, but just specifically doing this peak shaving technique. I should say too, uh, Nova Scotia does have, I don't know about the New Brunswick PI and Newfoundland markets, but Nova Scotia does have um, time of day billing. However, to access that time of day billing here in Nova Scotia, you have to have a thermal storage unit. So some means to store electric heat as well as some other things like time clocks for big electrical loads. So you can access it. The spread in our um, on peak to off peak rates isn't that great. And the season I think is only about three months. So it's not the most, uh, economically viable for us yet. But this is really where we think the market's going and there's plenty of evidence with our utilities and other utilities across the country to, uh, to agree with this, is demand side load management. There's other terms for it, the micro grid, community feeder projects, um, you know, the list goes on and on. But essentially what it is, most utilities, you know, you listen to NB Power with their current partnership with Siemens, and you listen to some of these other major utilities outside what's going on in Newfoundland with the Lower Churchill project. Most utilities don't foresee themselves building another generating station, definitely in our lifetime. What they want to do is shift the onus onto the individual consumers. So if every consumer ends up with a battery wall on their home, and there's some communication protocol, and most battery manufacturers, Tesla, LG Chem, Solar Edge, are offering what they call APIs, which allow the utility to talk to individual homeowners' battery walls so they can pull that power when they need it. Because that's one thing about um, solar energy, the sun never shines to match demand on the grid. So if they have this micro grid or a micro storage system, it starts opening up some great options for them. One, they don't have to look at building another generating station. Two, they can meet energy supply shortages. So if their grid is not producing enough for a demand event, they can quickly, uh, you know, with that API, call on those individual battery walls to, to uh, meet the shortage maybe that they're seeing on the grid at that time. Also hedging against pricing volatility, you know, Amir here and MB Power, we all do the same things. We have energy traders uh, at these utilities who buy and sell power all day up and down the Eastern seaboard. So if there was a demand event going on and, and the pricing on uh, power was going up, it's a way for those utilities to hedge against that volatility. And the last, and we see it, um, we see it too frequently probably here in Nova Scotia, I'm sure New Brunswick, PI yeah, and Newfoundland are the same, but grid stability, you know, we've had outages last year where we had power out for almost uh, 10 or plus days, I think in rural areas of Nova Scotia. So, if you have battery deployed and solar energy paired with that battery storage, now you have a more robust grid. So maybe your 
you're down at whatever substation or you're down on whatever line, but you can have microgrids within the, the main grid. So that way each home can access stored power from any battery bank that's tied into their local grid. So a utility outage doesn't have to be all encompassing. You get a lot more redundancy and stability on your grid with demand side load management. And here's some projects for anyone who's familiar with them. The first I became aware of was the, um, was the Elmsdale pilot project here in Nova Scotia, which was uh, I think 10 homes done with Tesla power walls. And that was through an API interface. So Nova Scotia can charge and discharge those batteries and pay those homeowners a premium for that stored power when they need it. And uh, the one that just went through in New Brunswick, there was a tender that closed, I think a couple of weeks ago. I know uh, we were working with the distributor here on bidding it but it was for 50 homes, a combination of around eight kilowatts of solar and battery storage. And it was a partnership between, I think Tesla ended up winning that bid as well, but it was between uh, MB Power, Siemens, and now look what looks like will be Tesla. And then, um, you know, there's been some other projects as well. Nova Scotia Power's head office has some large uh, Tesla battery storage going on, as well as some other substations around the province have some battery storage now under a pilot program. So the last thing I want to touch on, I know we're, we're just a couple minutes over, this will only take a minute, and we, we do want to keep these on time because I know my ability to stay focused on a webinar for more than 30 minutes is tough, but I do want to touch on electric vehicles because we are going to have a separate webinar just for electric vehicles. And electric vehicle and the whole concept, we've all been hearing, I'm sure, about it for years and years and years. But what we're starting to see now in our market is what's known as the hype curve. So the hype around electric vehicles, which that curve is typically exponential, and the adoption rate, which is typically flat. But we're starting to see a real shift in adoption. Uh, there's over 100,000 EVs on the road in Canada today. In the province of Nova Scotia today, I don't even think there's more than 400 registered electric vehicles. But over the next two to five years, that's gonna change significantly. You know, they're talking 60% market share for electric vehicles within the next 20 years. And this number keeps creeping down and down and down. And this is that exponential curve I talked about. If we put a, a line in here, you would see that start to ramp up steeply, the um, amount of EV sales in Canada. And specifically in Nova Scotia, I'll use an example. I just mentioned that, um, you know, there's less than 400 they're predicting in the next five years in Atlantic Canada, there will be over 100,000 EVs. And what does that mean? That means, um, you know, every one of those EVs for the most part is going to need a charger on the home and also need the infrastructure around the provinces to support that adoption rate. So right now, just from a technology perspective, there's three levels of charging, level one, level two, and level three. And what you'll see those typically used for is, you know, level one is your plug-in residential, really slow charge times, not that uh, valuable unless you're really in a pinch. Level two, this is where we're going to see probably the most individual products sold because most homeowners who buy an electric vehicle will want a charger on the home. And of course, all those peripheral, peripheral electrical products to support that charger. And then level three, this is really getting into your fleet and service station. I know there's a call here in Nova Scotia for over 3,000 um, fleet or service station level three DC fast chargers over the next few years. So it is a, a very important market sector and I would encourage anyone who wants to learn more about that to get on one of our webinars next week, which will specifically look at the market potential there. And just to finish up, um, you know, this was really just to give you a feel for the potential of these markets, but these are the manufacturers we currently represent in this space. So feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions on these products. As always, you can follow us on social media as well as check out our website for our full line card. And here's a field just for the webinars we've got coming up. So we're gonna run them Tuesdays and Thursdays, 11 o'clock and one o'clock. And as I mentioned earlier, it's gonna be specific to the industry, sorry, general to the industry, not specific to product. So thanks for your time. Sorry we ran a few minutes late. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to stay on. Hopefully maybe Matt or Taylor can turn their microphone on and just let me know if all the questions were answered. Uh, can you hear me, Mark? Yeah. Yes. Um, all the questions that I can see are answered. Um, the only thing is if anyone asked you directly, we won't be able to see them. Okay, let me bring 